Welcome to Cherry Street Investor Education with Kavita Baratake, passive income coach and founder of Cherry Street Investments. Education that is designed for you to take control of your financial life. Join us to learn how you can create multiple passive income streams, diversify your portfolio, save on your taxes, and much more. Become a better investor and fast track your financial goals. Here's your host, Kavita Baratake. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on why Build for Rent must be on your investment radar. I'm your host, Kavita Bartake, founder and, uh, founder and infinity banking broker at Cherry Street Investments. I have with me Sanjay Raghavaraju, who's the founder and CEO of 33 Holdings, which is an Atlanta-based real estate investment firm. I'll talk a little bit more about Sanjay as well as myself a little further down. But first, let's talk about this topic today. The built for rent or built to rent, also called built to rent, takes the best aspects of single family residential and upgrades the experience by developing all homes inside a professionally managed community. These built to rent properties are not just low density multifamily properties or a locationally clustered single family rental portfolio. They are much more akin to traditional gated residential neighborhoods with co great community amenities as well as um, professional management without burdening residents with HOA costs or servicing mortgage credit debt. Uh, come learn about this asset hybrid asset class from our guest speaker today uh, and real estate expert Sanjay Raghavaraju. As I mentioned, San Sanjay is the founder and CEO of 33 Holdings, which is a private equity real estate firm based out of Atlanta, Georgia. I spent a lot of time with Sanjay and visited him in Atlanta and he took me driving around Different of uh, different projects of his. So thank you, Sanjay, for taking the time out to show me around. So what will you walk away with from this webinar today? You'll understand what that bill for rent space is and why it's growing so dramatically. What are occupancy levels? Where are the most active markets as far as bill for rent is concerned? Where are the bid for end rental rates, right? Like what makes them attractive and what is the pipeline of the new supply? How have demographic trends of Gen Y and impact of COVID led to the growth for each of each market? And why is major institutional capital flowing into the space at such a dramatic rate? Uh, finally, we'll also talk about why Built for Rent pro uh, is attracting multifamily investors. So we will get this started right now. So uh, before we I hand this off to Sanjay, I just want to Claim a disclaimer here. Everything we you do here is just uh, for educational purposes only. Before you make any investment, and we're not offering any investment today, this is an education only event. Please always, before make you make uh, make any investment, consult your attorney, financial advisor, or CPA. Uh, a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions, please don't type it in the chat box. Uh, find the Q&A box and type it there. It just uh, allows us to not have to deal with a lot of noise in the chat box. Uh, Bhanik, if you have any questions, please type it in the Q&A box. I see you raising your hand. This webinar will always be recorded. I get a bunch of emails every time asking if there'll be a recording. There'll always be a recording and it will go out tomorrow morning. I try to get it out in the morning. Sometimes it might be afternoon tomorrow. It will also be posted on YouTube if you're following my channel on YouTube and I'll be sharing the link shortly. Um, please uh, add my email to your contact list so it doesn't go to your spam folder. Just a few upcoming webinars we'll be having. We are talking about Roadmap to Financial Freedom with my partner and colleague, Elisa Zhang. Uh, we'll also talk about investing in short-term rentals, which is Airbnbs with Sandeep Nanda, who's a very experienced Airbnb operator. Uh, we'll talk about investing in ATMs. Yes, these are traditional cash ATM machines. Um, they actually throw out a lot of cash, just like they throw out a lot of cash when you're using an ATM. Uh, as an investment, they're really good uh, investments in, uh, in during recessions. Uh, Dave Zook will come talk about this investment. And if you have any other feedback, any topic that is of interest to you, would love to learn more and would love your feedback, you can shoot me an email anytime. I appreciate your feedback. 
So if you are looking for recordings of all our webinars as well as other investor education, please hit the subscribe button and you will be auto notified of any new uploads of content here. This is Cherry Street Investor Education. You can go to YouTube. I also have an investor group called Purely Passive Investor Group on Facebook. If you'd like to join us there, all, all of this information is always posted on this group. And there are also other people posting on this group. So it's a great resource for you to use. A quick introduction to me. I'm from Bangalore, India. I moved here in 1998, um, a, a reformed techie. I was in technology for 20 years. And it, it seems like I work with a lot of technologists or ex-people from tech. And Sanjay is one of those two. He spent years in technology and then moved to real estate. So we had this common uh, background as we met each other and we, we, we had a lot of things in common there. So I started in real estate in 09 and then quit my job in 2019 to start uh, uh, move, move into real estate full time. Uh, my company is Cherry Street Investments. I focus a lot on educations, as you guys all hear today, and also help people invest passively in real estate, as well as um, high cash value, value insurance policies. If you're wondering what that is, look up infinite banking. It's a concept, and it's a great concept. So, uh, all right, Sanjay here today. I'm excited to have Sanjay on today. He's actually been on one more panel discussion that I had last year sometime, right, Sanjay? Um, That's right. That was yes. really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Sanjay shared his story and it was very motivating. If you guys want to look that up, it's called Penniless to Success. Don't ask me about the title. That's what I could think of right then. But it kind of describes a lot of three, three real estate investors who went from, you know, uh, wherever they were in their lives to actually being very successful entrepreneurs and real estate investors. So Sanjay was one of them who spoke and he really shared a lot of his own life experiences and his motto, if I remember right, is just to just do it. Is that right, Sanjay? That's right. I just <laughs> copied from Nike. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Hey, it's a, it's a good one, right? Yeah. So Sanjay is a tech executive. He, he spent a lot of, how many years did you spend in tech, Sanjay? Uh, from about uh, 08 to 015. Um, Okay. Sorry, not 08, uh, 98. Um, so yeah, that's what I thought. I was like, years, no, yeah. you got to be a little bit before yeah. 08 yeah. there. <laughs> 20, 20 years. So. Yeah, 20 years in tech. And then he moved into real estate in 2015. And uh, I don't think he's ever looked back. He's very successfully running 33 Holdings out of Atlanta. And um, the goal that 33 Holdings has is to generate risk-adjusted returns for their investors. As the CEO, he's responsible for the vision and strategy of his company, as well as investor relations. He has an unparalleled track record of leading teams to greatness through improved synergy, leadership, operational excellence, and relationship building. The one thing I noticed about Sanjay, he's very good at honing in on talent, and he's really assembled a great team together, right? He really spots people and figures out their spot in his uh, in his grand scheme of things <laughs> <laughs> we spotted you too kavita come on <laughs> so uh, with that i'm gonna hand it off to sanjay to share uh, his presentation and i'm excited to learn along with you guys if you have any questions again please put that in the q a box and not in the chat box sanjay it's all yours take it away okay um, thank you, Kavita, and thanks, everybody, and good evening, everyone who are just joining in. Um, I'm sure most of you are here trying to learn a few things um, about the build-to-rent uh, build uh, asset class. Uh, my intent really is to be very informational, and then we can park all of our questions to the end. Um, just to clarify, um, this is not an investment pitch. We are not uh, providing any of the projects or any of our funds and everything. So it is strictly to understand the dynamics of the bill to rent and why this should be in your investment radar. And for those of you who are interested in um, learning more or engaging with Kavita and me um, has part of the bill to rent so you can make your investments, please um, go to the interest form, which will also be shared by Kavita in the chat and also be sent in the email following up so you can uh, uh, put your interest, and then I'm sure Kavita and myself will engage further as we start launching uh, our build-to-end projects. 
So I think with that, um, this is Sanjay again. I'm based out of Atlanta. Um, the, like many of you, I'm originally from India, came here uh, with the dollar dreams, uh, technology, uh, you know, maxed out at a cap at the um, vice president level, um, and then pretty much had a choice to make. Uh, so then I ventured into real estate, uh, met uh, one of my amazing partners, Mr. Corey Olno. Uh, and since then, we've never looked back. Uh, recently, we are merging with a construction company and trying to be a fully vertically integrated company who can do brokerage, property management, construction, and capital management. So we focus on risk-adjusted returns. Uh, we've been in the single family asset class since we started the business. However, we have diversified into multifamily, industrial, um, and other asset classes too. So with that, uh, just a disclaimer, I am in no way a economist or I'm trying to predict uh, um, particular financial numbers here. This is strictly based on our own experience on what we do and some of the investment offerings we do. We are not soliciting any uh, investment on this uh, webinar. This is strictly informational. For those of you who are interested, please express interest. And only when you express interest, we will explicitly come and engage with you. So with that, um, as Kavita said, uh, the, it's called build to rank, build for rank, whatever you call it. It's simply abbreviated as SFR slash B2R, uh, the single family rental. So you'll see this uh, throughout the presentation. So let's uh, get back really to the basics, right? Uh, what is uh, housing to start with? And I'm sure with COVID and everything, it has changed uh, the ways we are thinking of where we work, where we live and where we play and where we go to school and do everything, right? I'm sure everybody will be aligned with that in the last one year since it's very fresh in our memory. So housing is really a living space and it doesn't matter what you're trying to do in a living space. Everybody thought housing was all about where you have a family and you stay but I think that notion has changed um, very deeply for most of us. So we are in the world called spaces where you can go to school from the home. You can live there. You can work there. You can play there. So with that, and especially with COVID, and you put the supply and demand numbers, there are really two people who have benefited from this, from COVID. On the one side, the homeowner, as most of you know, the single family home is one of the largest asset classes out there. So it is no surprise, home prices are going up and up and up on the left side, as you can see. However, very calmly on the right side, there is also a huge growth for the landlord and the investor should one choose to. And that is where the concept of single family rental slash the bill to rent comes in. And single family rental is not a new concept. The bill to rent is not a new concept. It's been for 10, 15 years. However, nobody lo looked at it that way. There are a very, very few companies who used to do this. Probably we could count them in your hands, but now it has changed. So just let's look at the single family rental before we dive down into the bill to rent, right? If you see here, there is a huge migration, call it uh, post COVID, or in COVID, people moving from other suburban location is about 41%, and 59% of them are moving from urban locations. This is a data stat from one of the very well-known uh, consulting companies in the single family rental industry. And also there's few other quotes from other publications as to why this has changed, especially in 2021. Again, you can see these quotes are all just recently coming up. Um, the option to rent is more affordable than buy. Um, the home prices are growing at a 60% since 2012 versus rent increase at 20 to 30%. And of course, the formation of these household is doubling. However, the pace of the home construction is not able to keep up with the doubling of the household. So you put all these factors together and you figure out the supply, demand and affordability Let's just pause and take a look. If you look to the right, look at the supply of existing homes. Again, this is Federal Reserve economic data. I am not uh, pulling this from our stats and how we are looking at this. This is government validated audited data. 
and you can see we went all the way from 2010 about in the recession when we had 2008 and that whole recession come how the existing home supply started dwindling down as we know a lot of investment companies have got them they started um, executing on deals and it has been a very very lucrative uh, opportunity to create a cap rate which is what everybody is after which is called alpha seeking alpha and on the left you see the average home price has gone up from 300 302 500 to 346 that is roughly a 43 to 44 grand increase in a matter of 5 years so prices are up supply is down and the affordability of people who can afford this home has gone down from 63 million roughly to 56 million that is a year on year 12 percent decrease so you put all these dynamics together and there's your perfect storm right as they say when a storm comes there's always challenges but when challenges are there and when you fly into the storm that's when the biggest opportunities are there too and i think the build to rent is one such asset class that is starting to come out based on the initial data from the covid um, or even before covid for that matter that is getting successful so let's just look at what is it right it is basically nothing but horizontal apartment communities instead of going vertical you're going more horizontal for example if you have a garden style or a townhome style apartment that could be called in a way a single a built to rent community or an SFR community for that matter. And there's more space. People are not just focused on one rental unit. They are focused on a community where there is a gated community, on-site maintenance, which is also professionally managed. So imagine living with all the perks of the apartment, but living in your own house. When you step out, everything is catered for for you from where you want to play and maybe even where you want to work in the clubhouse or you want to go for a swim or go for a walk. All these amenities put together make the bill to rent just like an apartment stuff. So as you can see, it is really a blend of between the multifamily and the single family. And of course, you can buy it in bulk. You can sell one at a time or, you know, however hard you try, you are just like a person who owns a home who's owner occupied because there's no difference in how this home looks and that home looks. Of course, it's a different kind of a build out. It may look a, you know, more they call it builder grade versus more luxury line. But again, at the end of the day, there's, there's different demographics uh, out there on how they would do this. So if you can see people moving from apartments is 32%. People moving from their own homes is 17%. And from other single family rentals, of course, is the highest at 46%. Most of these tenants are stable. They are married. They have kids. So they stay for longer, unlike in the apartment units where usually the run rate is a year or two years. Here, you're looking at three and five years run rate, usually with families. Now, Everybody will ask, um, for any asset class, the number one uh, key is revenue, right? Revenue is done by occupancy. And if you track the historical occupancy happening in this country, we have become a renter's nation. Let's take a pause there. We have become a renter's nation. We are no longer in a nation where the American dream was to own and home. The dynamics have changed. There's been some very macroeconomic shifts, uh, how the Gen Z's, Gen Y's are thinking. The Uber economy is here. The Airbnb economy is here. People want to move from places. They want to be more mobile. They don't want to be attached to a given thing. They want to focus more on the intangible benefits of life more and more, as opposed to getting tied down to a given asset for 30 or 50 years where some of our parents and our earlier generations used to do. So that itself is changing and that's why the occupancy is being created, right? Of course, you cannot just say where does build to rent happen because at the end, build to rent is an investment play. It is not a owner occupied play, which is why 
the investors usually make a smart decision on how the income is generated and everything so not every market is suitable for built to rent for example there are certain pockets there are certain areas that will that are power houses for example austin and phoenix and you come to the southeast there is greenville and knoxville these are all emerging markets the markets that have already been saturated and penetrated are of course phoenix atlanta orlando again all this goes based on the affordability of home you can't do a built to rent project in uh, new york city or new jersey or in chicago just, the numbers just don't work because the cost of land is very high so you have to really systematically think why this asset class is competing with the other asset class kavita earlier told a uh, lot of multi family folks are uh, coming to this asset class i would argue the other way saying not only multi family most importantly people from retail people from hospitality people from multi family people from single family and of course stocks and crypto are all chasing more a real asset given the inflation growth that we are going to see in the future given the way the way money is getting printed around so i'm sure most of you are investors here and you understand those dynamics how money moves and how inflation goes and how you need to hedge with real assets versus speculation or crypto or stocks which is a whole different debate i don't want to get into so with that you know let us focus on who these people are right in general these people are usually more mature they are older people they are married they have kids they are staying more longer in these houses they are not the people who are uh, usually the blue collared people uh, they are folks more we call them white collared people so they are stable they are staying longer the parents on time so it is a different kind of a bracket you are dealing with versus in a multi family a class c or a class d apartment building you could compare the B, b to r more to a class b plus or an a minus especially because it's a newer product and what are these products right what are these products that built to rent really build again we've kind of uh, boiled our boxes to about four boxes how we look at it it is anywhere between a you know call it a tiny home or an apartment home from 650 square foot all the way to a luxury line up to 2800 square foot i've even seen people doing 3000 and above square footage but i don't know how the numbers would work um the only reason they would work is your land cost should be very very low and if you look at the density on the right a typical density is about 8 to 10 i would say but counties are opening up now slowly to this new asset class and they are starting to get a little open smaller units with more amenities are going in so that is that is how we are seeing this evolving um we play in kind of the two ranges anywhere between the 1500 to about 2500 range ours are not luxury depending on the density we do town homes or we do more single family homes but the demand in these areas is just huge given the amount of need in occupancy we have seen and also from an investor perspective the need to deploy capital and make a return right so what makes this special like it is exactly if you see the amenities on the screen here between the external amenities all the way from a pool all the way to a clubhouse or a spa or an internal amenity which is pretty standard in this the kind of flooring the sinks the cabinets the carpets the fixtures all are starting to get more and more in demand to create value if you see the fireplace is 0% in a rental people really don't bother and don't care about a fireplace whereas in a owner occupied that is definitely adds a lot of value so if you look at the dynamics of how this needs are it is a pure play investment play right and then really what kind of people are coming and staying at this what demography people this is a report from the john burns uh, consulting group where we are evaluating 
uh, in partnership, uh, in consulting with them, some of the stats here you see. Um, the age group is usually about 50 and above right now, which is a very, very stable uh, demography. They pay rent on time. They are very well equipped financially, but slowly we are seeing this go into the earlier cohorts too, around in the 30s. And as you can see, it is about 3.6 and 3.7 million there, right? So the need is out there, but how do you validate this need? The need is validated by all these big players, really. You see on the screen, there are some very few big players. Again, I said few because it's relatively a newer asset class that had started from 2020, starting with JP Morgan, um, Haven Realty, um, BlackRock, Lenar Homes, and now Pulte Homes is getting into it. All the home builders are getting into it. Why? Because we find it has more cap rate power over other asset classes is what we are seeing, especially in a post-COVID world. Right. So how do we look at this going from how the B2R is and how it needs to be? It really depends on how much of a value creation that it is done. Right. I'm not here uh, going to explain more about a multifamily versus a single family. My focus more about is this new asset class that is more in between and the kind of demand that we are seeing out there. Right. So if you look at the dynamics or the outlook for the single family, here are a few predictions that I would like to kind of make sure you all take away. Both the SFR has lot of recent movement in terms of creating the housing stock. Big institutions to small players are playing in this. So it is very, very important to understand the greater dynamics happening. And more importantly, home builders are moving to this. We have seen both Pulte um, and a few big home building, Lenar, uh, move into these things. They are working with investment groups to create this more built to rent product, really. And we have always seen a systematic shift or macro dynamics playing in in the economic centers on why this makes it a better asset class. Of course, there's challenges in the bill to rent uh, because of the cost of land, the lumber prices going up, it has its own challenges, but we are looking at this more for the long run, right? Where at 33 holdings, we are trying to buy land, develop land, build the vertical and create a complete value creation that we are trying to do. So. The intent really is how do you compete with other asset classes and why is this becoming the winner more and more? And the answer is simple. As Kavita said during the start of this webinar, the multifamily cap rates are going down. With COVID, we have seen more and more people moving to the suburban areas, wanting more room, wanting more land, more wanting more space in their homes. So people are understanding that it is very important to have a home, important to go for walks, enjoy the nature versus going and living in more an apartment. But don't get me wrong, apartments are still a very valuable asset and still make a good alpha. So the competition is not between a multifamily and a built to rent. Built to rent itself on its own is a evolving asset class that everybody needs to have it in their investment radar because it has a better cap rate, you may not be making money in the first two to three years of a given bill to rent. But once you refinance and once you are doing that play, and if you are in the game through all the vertical from the land, it is one of the best returning uh, investments based on all the numbers we have seen um, going on right now. So I'm just doing a quick uh, time check here, Kavita. Uh, I know we want to take a lot of questions, so I want to be respectful of uh, the time we have to. Uh, I can go a little bit or I can pause and take, uh, you know, we can take no, questions. I think we can go a little bit more, um, Sanjay. Okay. We don't have a whole lot of questions yet, but folks, if you have any questions, feel free to type them. So I need to judge how much time we'll get through the questions. Don't hold your questions till the end because I'm watching the Q&A. 
Um, Sanjay, you can keep going at least until I'd say 8.15 my time, which is 9.15 your time. Okay, thank you. Um, and then really, you know, I wanted to also put out there like what we do as a company. Uh, we are a vertically integrated company, as you can see with the brokerage management, construction, and also capital management. And we also have a co-working uh, space that we do, that we are playing in. Um, and also we, we invest into the residential, commercial, and industrial assets, but as it relates to residential, we are doing fix and flips, we are doing fix and holds, but with the change in the uh, asset classes, we are focused more on build to rent and build to sale to, more from a distressed and a value add. These are, it is getting very, very challenging to go after assets right now, especially in the fix and flip and fix and hold. However, the build to rent, if you know what you're doing and the kind of alpha you're chasing, the need out there in terms of the occupancy and everything is just huge, right? So that is where we are seeing a huge growth in this asset class. So with that, you know, I want to touch on a few more areas actually. Um, let me showcase this. Uh, the supply demand affordability chart, and I really want everybody to know the need around the affordability is a huge crisis right now happening uh, in the US across cities, across counties, um, city officials. It's one of the number one problem happening because to go build a house, the average house pricing throughout the US is about 345K, which is not in a reachable arm's length, probably to 80% of the demographic out there which is a huge crisis happening and build to rent is a solution, but not the solution because it only provides a rental option uh, and people want to move and everything. So I think with the demand out there, rather than looking at it from a multifamily versus uh, build to rent or single family, I would look at it as its own asset class, which has its own legs right now. And if it is a different kind of a investment thesis where you are collecting a bunch of units within a given community, larger community, and you're coming in and just like an syndicator or an investor, just like you're coming into a multifamily deal. So with that, uh, Karita, if you want to take yeah. questions, I know those may take uh, back Absolutely. and forth too. Yeah, and you can go to the last page. So folks have, um, I've put, pasted that link um, to sign up if you are interested in being notified of future investments. We don't have, any, we have stuff in the pipeline right now, but nothing to announce right now. Uh, this is purely educational. So I hope you guys learned something here and we will get to the questions now. All right. The questions are coming in. So the first question Rishi asks is, what is the best way to own cash flowing BTR properties, not syndication? And what cities are best BTR markets? Um, I think the best way to own, sorry, hang on. You guys see my screen? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, from, from a, seeing the market really, again, I would argue more the Sun Belt states is one of the best um, markets if you would ask me right now, just because of the affordability. Uh, we are also seeing some great traction in the Dallas area, uh, Texas area. Uh, however, uh, Austin, I wouldn't say is a good market for rental, great market for buying, selling, uh, given the um, costs are going up and everything. So the, just for folks who don't know, I mean, Sunbelt is Arizona, everything to the south, right? Texas, Georgia, what, what else is Florida? What else is in the Sunbelt states? Uh, so the Sunbelt usually are uh, towards the, the southeast mostly, North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, Georgia, where the sun is up there. Uh, of course, you can also kind of claim towards the middle too. Uh, but the huge demand of the epicenter is happening in the Southeast. And of course, also the Texas, Arizona, those areas. Too. Right. New Mexico as well as, yeah. 
So what uh, what cities are best BTR markets? Uh, if you would ask, the emerging markets in the southeast are Gre- uh, Greenville in South Carolina and Knoxville in Tennessee. Uh, if you ask uh, the western side, again, San Francisco won't work, Portland, Oregon's won't work. You have to be in specific markets where you can chase uh, Alpha, uh, Tucson and uh, Fort Collins in Colorado. Austin and Phoenix are more powerhouses. Uh, they are they are challenging from a cost perspective right now to change yield, uh, but that's where you need more higher density for those numbers to work. Right, it's it's a definitely very challenging in Austin. My numbers don't work for built to rent projects, so I do see some built to rent projects in Austin coming up, and I don't know how they're making the numbers work because you need a little more density given the cost of land here. So mm-hmm. definitely challenging. So the best way to own cash flow in BTR properties is not syndication. I think that's pretty challenging because it can get quite expensive because you're owning the entire community, isn't it, Sanjay? Yeah, again, there's risk and reward, uh, just like anything. Uh, The best way to own the cash flowing, frankly, is to be buying land, adding value to the land, and building a vertical. I think that's the only way you make a good cash flow according to us and that is what we do and that is how we bring investors in uh, like people like Kavita um, and stuff like that. However, if you are buying a finished product from a builder, all you're doing is buying at a discount because you're trying in bulk or you're trying to buy pre-inventory, will you make a cash flowing asset? Absolutely. But the larger challenge for you is going to be is to hit that mark. These are newer houses. So your real bet is just making a very little cash flow. There is no maintenance. Um, you know, you have warranties and stuff like that. Things don't break as much. So you can bank on a little cash flow, but not as much. So Rishi, to answer your question, I know you asked about not using a syndication to own. Uh, the thing is, you are not going to be able to buy a unit in a BTR, in a community of BTR, which is a BTR, because essentially the whole community is one big property, just like it was a multifamily property, if it makes sense. It's like an apartment complex, but except it's horizontal, right? So I don't know that we can, you can own it by yourself um, unless you have millions of dollars. Uh, Corey asked, you describe a builder grade product that you intend to rent as a whole community. Don't you expect to see a lower resale value upon your exit versus surrounding communities? Um, So the value creation in the B2R is just like an apartment. It is based on NOI, right? It's based on net operating income. Of course, there is value based on how you're performing it, but you have to treat this just like an apartment complex. It doesn't matter density. It does not matter the rents. The NOI at the end is going to do this, right? So it's no different from an apartment complex. So the builder grade, are you doing the luxury line? It all depends on how the sponsor and how one is running the project, really. Yeah. So basically, the answer is the resale value is based on the NOI, Corey, just like an apartment. All right. Uh, price range for built to rent. Uh, if, the, if the question is more around what it takes to build or what it takes to uh, buy one, um, again, this is a very tricky question. It all depends on the cost of land, where the location is. Um, you know, the variable, of course, is the lumber pricing right now and other cost and labor. But however, in general, a built to rent product you'll see makes sense in the mid 200 case um, to probably up to a 400K product. That is where majority of the built to rent units are from a value and exit price. And then you add a rental portion to it, right? So cap rates are usually happens at, I would say six to 8%. Uh, if you look at apartments, your cap rate is between a, probably these days, if you're lucky, four, uh, maybe three, five. you know. Yeah, three to four five. for classes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, classes and then Bs as you go. And here, a, even a class A can give you up to 8%. And if you are pretty much in the land and land dev and you have the patience of time, because these are longer projects that take on. Um, you will see double-digit uh, cap rates, really. 
and that's really the trick of uh, doing these build to orders all right colin asks what specific criteria should an investor evaluate when selecting a b2r community or a b2r developer how is it different than evaluating a multifamily syndication i think that's a very good question thank you for that question colin yeah it's a very good question but let me tell you you all are investors it's all about the sponsor sponsor and sponsor right so frankly there's no other trick you all you're looking at is cap rates and noi Uh, we can all give you the NOIs and the cap rates at the start, but how we are on a consistent basis through management, through operational efficiency, making sure there is value creation is all uh, that matters. So it is exactly like an apartment complex or any other investment in the retail, hotel, or other asset classes. So I would highly encourage you. Your criteria should be to evaluate the sponsor. of course to evaluate the location right the location plays a very very important role in b2r just like housing in general but the general trend is uh, you have to be close to schools you have to be closer to a given urban pot pocket in a suburban for example um, going to the grocery store should be a quick run it shouldn't be miles and miles as if you are living like 45 minutes out for the movies or anything like that so those are some uh, intangible key areas to look for where we have it in our criteria when we go for a built to rent project um access to the highway and stuff like that too those little things they matter a lot yeah um sanjay i have a following question to that from my end really um mm-hmm. so if i'm looking at the single family home prices in a market i'll take san antonio right it's still affordable where the single family home rates are like 200 to 300 average so mm-hmm. it's still on the affordable range so in that sense of kind of market does a built to rent even make sense yeah see the you have to think about uh, built to rent as for example if you are putting a 200k to 300k product and if you are able to rent it to uh, you know anywhere between 1600 to 1800 that's an excellent investment right but um, if, let's say you're competing with single family homes in the market from a rental perspective where single family homes maybe have bigger yard sizes and more space uh, wouldn't it be direct competition for you from a single family rental perspective um uh, because single family at the end of the day has more space right so if i'm in the same rent range does that even make sense for a built to rent product yes again one of the theses of the built to r to work is also renting is cheaper than owning right so if the dynamic or the case in a given market where owning is more better let's say in san antonio you would not see as many built to rent projects be sure right however there is also a need psychologically between the gen z's and gen y and all not to own a given because people don't want to be stuck to house they don't want to be staying in the same place year after year after year so these are people who also you know both are working they rather come to the house have the lawn taken care of go for a walk with their dog go play in the pool but they don't want to go take care of all their own yard you know the backyard and everything like that so there's that demography of people who prefer the renting experience but don't want an apartment complex but rather want a backyard and a dog walking trail and stuff like that makes sense thank you arishi asks what cities have the biggest gap between supply and demand for btr is it the I same think, yeah yeah pretty much the sun belt areas is where we are seeing the migration happening so i'm sure most of you have seen trends um you know the texas area is huge uh, georgia carolina florida is huge especially with covid lot of new yorkers and new jersey folks are moving down there including dallas austin lot of migration from the west coast given the tech growth happening there so really these are the common areas uh, you are not seeing anything in seattle we are not seeing portland we are not seeing anything in chicago new jersey and all those areas it's just a you know there is there is literally no land and even if land is there it's a premium so those numbers don't work sorry one uh, to add to that there's another question which will kind of be similar is that is houston san antonio or boise a good place to invest in btr boise is a very good place houston is a very good place in general 
um, given the kind of economic growth um, uh, that is happening. Again, just like uh, apartments, the need is all about where employment attraction happens. And when you're seeing employers move into these areas, I would just follow the path because housing chases employers. And we are talking to um, you know, city officials where they are challenged to attract employment to their communities because they're not able to provide housing uh, demand. And they are working with developers like us, private equity groups like us, and say, hey, can you come and we'll give you tax breaks, you know, we'll give you these opportunity zone deals, come work with us, right? That's the kind of uh, um, outlook we are seeing in some of the, uh, we call them more the pocket cities that are not like within Atlanta, but you know, a one hour to one and a half hour drive from Atlanta, where a lot of people are migrating, they don't want to be in the city, they're just encompassed in these smaller locations. So there are a couple more questions here. Let's see. Uh, there are a lot of questions about the investment itself, Sanjay. Maybe we can club all that at the end. But I want to just first take the questions from an educational perspective before getting into the investment because we're not presenting an investment today. All right. Uh, I was wondering, okay, this one's not a good one. What is the target size of a BTR community? Do you have a target size when you look at communities? Uh, not really, it's just like numbers have to work. Um, just like, you know, in the apartment complex, uh, you can't, you need an on-site property manager and a facilities if you're running a full-scale community. So those units usually pencil in probably in the 80 and above uh, homes. So for you to justify an on-site maintenance, just for an on, on-site uh, presence and everything. So you're taking care of it more as, an, uh, um, as a business unit, right? Uh, I think anywhere less than 80 would be challenging, but again, it's all numbers driven. If you can, um, you know, the p &L can afford a maintenance and other uh, amenities and other folks out there. Got it, makes sense. Uh, same thing like apartments, right? Some certain number of units after that, it makes sense. It's the same same process, I guess, same. All right. That's right. Um, what is the exit strategy that you have in your B2R communities? Like what is your plan for your B2R communities? Yeah, for us, uh, we have about three B2R communities that we have started uh, late last year, which we are going into production about 100 plus lots this year we're trying to deliver. Uh, but our goal is we also have about six to seven projects in various phases. So hopefully we'll hit the 250 mark this year. Uh, but our goal is to just like we have done in the past uh, with single family portfolios. We aggregated them. We run them using our vertically integrated platform. Uh, but we just pretty much exit out to the larger REITs. Uh, if you see, there are these big, big uh, companies out there, um, you know, millions and billions. If you see Frontyard and uh, Pretium did a transaction at 2.5 billion. That was one of the highest value transactions out there as recently as January 2021. Mergers, consolidation is happening. And all these firms, all they do is they just want to acquire stabilized portfolios because they don't want to hedge on, you know, the risk of land and land development and all. And that is where I see the opportunity for folks like us uh, who are, you know, either through syndication or through land because these exit people, they want to buy these things, right? At the finished line. And they are willing to go at a 3% and a 5% cap rate versus the 6 and a 9 that anyone is getting because their access to capital is much less. And of course, they are running large-scale operations, so they are creating value addition in terms of other avenues. For example, a lot of these companies give their own uh, rent insurance. That is revenue creation. They do utility billing, you know. There's a lot of other amenities and pricing that they do. And of course, for them, it's a, it's a brand too. That makes sense. I know a lot of insurance companies and pension funds, they're all getting into buying real estate assets right now just to hedge against inflation. So they are willing to pay three and a half cap all day long for a new property. Absolutely. No, it's one of the few things where the B2R is more popular because it's new. Maintenance is low. And, uh, you know, I tell this little secret to my team. Just look at history. 
how after World War II, the apartment complexes were built. There was a mad rush, and that is exactly the mad rush happening in the built-to-rent community right now. So all we had to do is look back in history, read a few books, and read a few players, and track their path, how they did it. And we're just going and uh, rinsing and repeating. Remember, my, my inspiration is just do it. I just copy it from Nike, and I'm doing the similar thing here. We're just looking at how the apartment complex did it, and we are doing the same thing. And yeah. that's the same exact strategy. Yeah, and I think when you say apartment, I always tell people nowadays that to talk to you, I love apartments. I think multifamily is great, but multifamily has seen a huge run up from 2008 downturn to now that it's getting overvalued, right? The cap rates compressing. So you really have to think from an assets class perspective, are there better asset classes for you to be putting your money right now? Because if you're investing where everyone else is investing and there's a mad rush, then you should think differently and you should start looking at other assets, at least diversifying. You know, multifamily is good, but start diversifying and looking for other assets as well. So Corey asked, how long do you expect to hold your built in communities? I know you mentioned that your exit strategy might be to sell to uh, institutional. So how long is that? Usually three to four years or... Yeah, we have a very unique strategy in the sense uh, we we sell 50% of our communities out and we want to keep 50% of our communities. Uh, what that means is we will uh, stabilize it till the very end and then sell it to a REIT on a few. On a few that makes sense for us in the long run, we will continue to cash flow it and we continue to keep it uh, with the intent that uh, we want to hold the asset for a longer time. In the single family portfolio uh, era, our usual build like existing homes, it used to be three to five years, but on the newer product, I think we're going to hold them at least seven to 10 years. You know, why say no to mailbox money, right? Absolutely. It's, it's, it's kind of infinite banking here, actually. If you yeah. do it right and if you refinance it right, you know, you're just making money out of a zero dollar investment if you do it right. Right, absolutely. And I think it's also favorable from a tax perspective to refinance the investors and give them infinite returns for their whole period, right? Like and extend the whole period. So you minimize your depreciation recapture and um, taxation. So that's right. Love that strategy. Uh, let's see if there are stable tenants with good income, wouldn't they be willing to buy their own homes instead of renting four to five years in a B2R as Raman? Uh, you would be surprised. Uh, I would say yes and no. Uh, not everybody is as savvy. There's uh, larger shifts happening. People are wanting to get more variety, wanting to move places. A lot of dynamics are changing, you'll see. Um, that's a, you know, it depends on the individual really, how they are looking at their finances and stuff like that. But can we say that everybody's going to end up staying in a build, uh, B2R? No, just like the apartment communities, people... Uh, mature from them, they move on to the next level always. So this is one such class. It is just more attractive because also of the capital that is chasing these assets right now, because there's no housing stock out there and this affordability is a challenge. So we are seeing nobody wants to buy retail because Amazon disrupting them. Nobody is doing hospitality because Airbnb and COVID has changed a few things. Nobody wants to buy Multi, I wouldn't say nobody wants to buy. If you can get a multifamily, you're great, but you know you can't get the kind of cap rates that you're aspiring for the capital allocation. Uh, everybody's playing the, I call it the gamble in the stocks and the crypto. But when you look at real asset, the only real asset right now is centered around the home. Because in COVID, everybody realized how important the home is. Can you go and work in your home? Yes. Can you go to school from your home? Yes. But the other way around, can you live in a in a hotel? No, not more than a few days. Uh, can you go live in a retail center? No, when COVID came, right? So these are all the, you know, it's called common sense. If you go look at it, hey, how can I equip my house for uh, working from home? How can I equip my house for my kids going to school? For example, in one of our communities we are doing, we created a third level town home, not at the bottom, typically where you have a basement, you have an office and everything. We took the bottom and went it to the top. You know why? 
Light. From COVID, was that? Uh, a little more light and yeah. Yeah, light is one, uh, but also more importantly with COVID, you know, people are working and people are going to school. And if you are in the basement, you are hearing the kitchen noise, right? So by, by going upstairs, you really are elevating yourself. So you're more in a calm um, pair and you're making a good working environment. So, you know, we call it our COVID friendly feature where we put a third level on the top. So people can go hang out there, go to school there or just work from home there. That makes sense. I mean, I would like to work on a third level rather than the basement anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, basement is like that fad, right? You're, you're in the dungeon. So... All right, uh, a lot of questions. I'm just trying to figure out. Uh, there are some questions around the investment returns. Um, I mean, this is not an investment webinar really, but just generally, can we talk about what kind of returns can investors expect when they in invest in B2R projects? Um, again, uh, if you're interested guys, always go to this link. It is bit.ly slash BTR dash interest. Uh, you, and then it's also in the chat and it is also going to be in an email. So you can put your interest to Kavita and then we can engage further when opportunities arises. Yeah. Um, so the general um, returns, right? It also depends on a given model, whether we're doing a fund model or you're doing a project model. Uh, we are more a fund model where investors come into a fund and the fund is holding multiple assets because what happens in a B2R is you really don't make money during the first two to three years of a given project because you're buying entitled land, which is risky, and you're then going into land development, which is another risk, of course, lower risk than land, and then you're going vertical, which has its own construction risk. So there is no return making uh, ability up front, but when you average out over the period of your hold, you can make anywhere between 8 to 12 cap, provided you're coming into the land, the land development, and the vertical. And imagine this is a newer asset class, so there's very less maintenance ongoing going for at least the first three to five years. So the value creation does not happen up front. It happens in the late. There are other companies who just go and buy from builders at a discount tracks of you know 20 homes in a given community and all that and will your returns be different absolutely you can make anywhere between a i would say a four to a six return comfortably and if you're not making that um i would think twice of buying tracks of home in a uh, rental community so um sanjay just to clarify for some investors i don't think they'll necessarily understand the eight to ten cap uh, reference you put out there, um, let's say for a from a return, total return perspective, let's say they look at a five-year hold or a three-year hold, whatever the time period is. What kind of returns, like multiple of their investment, can they expect? Yeah, don't hold me to this. Uh, but the, no, 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 just uh, just the throw yeah, number. Out. Yeah, yeah. Through, so from a cash on cash return, right? The way we look at it is we always try to at a bare minimum hit a twenty percent cash on cash. I know that is very uh, uh, tough, but again, we are a private equity, um, so our model has to change uh, uh, go into that kind. That is why we come into a fund, we sell some, we keep some. We repurpose the capital, so it's all risk adjusted within the stuff. Will there be a bad orange and a bad apple here and there? Absolutely. But by creating multiples of assets over a period of three to five years, we are able to recapitalize, create 1031 strategies, and maybe even other opportunity zone strategies combined and give kind of those uh, value creation. However, in a general market, I would definitely look at a... 8 to 15 percent if you come in in the land phase and the land development phase and everything but if you're buying a finished product you're looking at anywhere between a you know six to an eight percent cap and a cash on cash roughly got it so there's a question about developing btr i think this is beyond the scope of this discussion um all right, uh, what else is open here? Which is like, why Greenville? I think that was one of the questions which came up. Why Greenville is a good market? Was that the job growth population demographics or? 
a very good question so let's look at uh, again this is just not greenville like many cities like this are popping up uh, greenville south carolina is about 3 hours from atlanta it's probably roughly 2 hours from rally durham and those kind of areas or a little bit more uh, if you look at what is happening in greenville right greenville has good employment base from auto manufacturers from bmws and kias out there they also have very good schools and universities and when people are migrating over they are evaluating do i really want to be in atlanta or do i want to be in greenville where traffic is less there are very very less people and then my quality of life is nice because in the new world or call it the post covid world you can literally live anywhere you want because a good 50% is going to be remote or a lot of technology is helping you do that right so those dynamics are really creating why these small pocket cities are really developing a lot uh, in my view but of course the driver is going to be employment base uh, education system and a given schooling system that uh, makes sense all right i think we'll wrap it up now thank you everyone for all the questions uh we try to get through all of them uh i think we'll wrap it up now it's just past the hour uh appreciate you again sanjay being here today uh and sharing a lot of insight here into this built to rent product and always happy to have you back on here again if you are interested in being notified of future built to rent projects that sanjay is going to put together please log your interest here and um, if i haven't met you already please set up a call with me i will share my calendly link or you can go on my website to set up a call with me uh, we won't just be taking any investors who walk through the door we we need to have a chat with you before and get to know you as well uh, if you've already chatted no problems you can just log your interest there Uh thank you again everyone and thank you Sanjay for taking time away to talk to all of us today. Have a good evening everyone and have a great day. Cool. Thank you everybody. Thanks Kavita for having me. Thanks Sanjay always. Hi, I'm Kavita Bartake. I hope you found this video useful and if you did, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel so you can get notified of any future videos I upload. I plan to cover a lot of investor education on this channel and I hope you'll stay with me for it. If you have any feedback on future content you'd like to see me cover, please drop me a note or a comment on my video. Thank you for watching and thank you for supporting me.